today, our focus is on, in particular, Exodus chapter 16. But more generally, the fascinating topic that finds its expression in a number of passages in Scripture, the manna, the miraculous food that sustained the nation of Israel for 40 years of wandering through the wilderness. And our attempt to glean from the story of the manna, the message of the manna, for us. Because, of course, as we've noted on many occasions, even when the Bible teaches us history, it's not teaching us history in order to teach us history. It's in order to teach us how to live our lives right now and here today. So, with that as the background, let's embark upon our discussion of the manna. Because, as I think we will see presently, as miracles go, this one is an especially problematic one. It's problematic in the circumstances that prompted it, which, said to admit, are not very positive ones with respect to the nation of Israel. And not only does the nation of Israel complain a lot before it gets the manna, it keeps on complaining an awful lot, almost frighteningly so, after it gets the manna as well, which inevitably raises the question, what was their problem? So embarking upon Exodus chapter 16 in this regard, we read beginning in Exodus chapter 16, verse 2, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would that we had died by the hand of God in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. As if, of course, they were having such a great time in Egypt. Verse 4, God's response. Then said God unto Moses, Behold, I will cause to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people will go out and gather a day's portion every day. And here's the catch. Just as a catch that we're still going to need to understand. That I may prove them or test them, whether they will walk in my commandments, my law, Torah, instruction, teaching, or not. Now note, there was one instruction already stated in verse 4, that the people will go out and gather a day's portion every day. There's another instruction that comes in verse 5. And it shall come to pass on the sixth day that they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gathered daily. Intriguing, because at this point, there is not yet any explicit mention of the Sabbath. But of course, it's coming. We'll get to there shortly. At present, there are two instructions, one each day to gather the day's portion, and the other, on the sixth day, to gather two days' portion. Verse 6, And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel, At evening then you shall know that God has brought you forth out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning then you will see the glory of God, for he has heard your murmurings against God. But what are we that you murmur against us? We're not the ones who are in charge here. The one who's in charge is God. And that point becomes further amplified when it is reiterated in the next verse, in verse 8, Moses said, This shall be when God will bring you, will give you in the evening flesh meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full. For that God heard your murmurings that you murmur against him. But what are we? 
your murmurings are not against us, against God. And verse 9, Moses said to Aaron, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before God, for he has heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spoke unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that he looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of God appeared in the cloud. And now, that message about the murmurings of the children of Israel, God stresses, that is, beginning in verse 11, and God spoke unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At dusk you shall eat flesh, eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you will know that I am God your Lord. So what happens is, verse 13, and it came to pass that at evening that the quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew round about the camp. And when the layer of dew was gone up, they discover underneath the dew, behold, upon the face of the wilderness was something. The Hebrew uses the term mechuspas, which is in the language of linguists. A haptax, a word that appears only once in all the Bible, it doesn't even appear to be any other word from its conjugation, from its root, that appears elsewhere in the Bible. So inevitably, there is some debate as to what it means, which is why we know that besides the rendering as a fine scale-like thing. There are other interpretations of grain-like, flaky, bare. In any case, something was on the ground, fine as the hoar frost on the ground, and in verse 15, and when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another. Here we have Another interesting ambiguity in the text, and we'll return to this point. The translation here says that what they said to one another was, what is it? Now, of course, they didn't say what is it, because they certainly were not talking in English. What they said in the Hebrew is, man who? Now, the question inevitably is, what does man who mean? It may be a question, and it may indeed mean, what is it? It may also be a statement. Man who, it is man. Meaning, well, here again, there is a question as to what it would mean. That is, is man here simply the proper noun? that we will encounter explicitly only later. It is manna, manna being a transliteration of sorts of the Hebrew man. It could also mean it is provisions or gift. We'll get back to that question a little bit later on as well. In any case, whatever they said, it was as a result of ignorance, because, of course, they knew not what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that God has given you to eat. And here, Moses conveys to the people God's first instruction on the subject. In verse 16, this is the thing that God has commanded, gather you of it every man according to his eating, meaning, an omer ahead, according to the number of your persons, shall you take it every man for them that are in his tent. You gather an appropriate amount for the number of people whom you are feeding. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more 
some less. And when they did meet it with an omer, they measured the amount, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. So, of course, on the one hand, those who didn't gather so much may have been gratified to learn that they were missing nothing. Those who had put a lot of effort into gathering a lot felt awfully frustrated because their extra effort produced no results. They all had, in fact, gathered an omer per person for whatever number of people each one of them was feeding. And now we continue. And this is inevitably, if you think about it, in verse 19, the flip side of gathering an appropriate amount for each person per day. In verse 19, and Moses said to them, let no man leave of it till the morning. It is supposed to be consumed in its entirety on the day that it is gathered. And in verse 20, we read of failing number one. That is, failing number one after they got the manna. We already saw the failing that preceded the manna, the murmurings, the complaining, maybe we could say the whining that preceded the gift of the manna in the first place. Now they've gotten it. And Moses says, let no man leave of it till the morning. And verse 20, we read, notwithstanding, the heart came not unto Moses, but some of them left of it until the morning. And it bred worms and rotted. And Moses was wroth with them, for obviously having disobeyed the instruction they were given. That's the first test it would appear, remember, that we already noted God referred to testing them through the manna. So test number one was to not leave any of it over, and they did. And the second test seems to begin in verse 22. And it came to pass on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. The implication is that they discovered when they came back from gathering what they thought had been the normal amount, that it was twice as much as they usually gathered. Remember, we already saw that the manna miraculously expands and contracts to be the appropriate amount for each household. But now they have twice the amount they had on any other day. And all the rulers or princes of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, now remember, in God's initial instruction, he spoke of gathering twice the normal amount on the sixth day, but there wasn't any explicit statement about the Sabbath. In verse 23, we are introduced to the Sabbath. And he said unto them, that is, Moses tells the princes of the congregation, this is that which God has spoken. Tomorrow is a solemn rest, a holy Sabbath unto God. Bake that which you will bake and seethe that which you will seethe, and all that remains over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. I feel compelled to note here, at least parenthetically, this is a very important verse for us in Scripture because this is the first place where we read explicitly in the Bible about the Sabbath as a day that pertains to human beings. Now, I realize that some people may immediately object, what are you talking about? We read about the Sabbath in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. We read about God desisting from work on the seventh day, to which Inevitably, my response is, that has nothing to do with human beings. That's God desisting from his creative work on the seventh day. Well, for that matter, on the first day, God created light. Do you create light every Sunday? If you don't create light every Sunday, there's no reason for you to assume that you're supposed to desist from creative activity on Saturday. Until, that is, Exodus chapter 16, verse 23. 
the first place where the Sabbath is explicitly presented as a day that impacts on people. That Israel is required to desist from creative work on the seventh day, on the Sabbath, and as a result, even the manna will not fall on the Sabbath, nor is there to be any effort put into collecting it on the Sabbath. They collect a double portion on the sixth day, and we read in verse 24 that miraculously, in contrast to what happened when they kept the manna overnight on any other day of the week, and they laid it up till the morning as Moses bade, and it did not rot, neither was there any worm therein. And Moses said, Eat that today. For today is the Sabbath unto God. Today you shall not find it in the field. And of course, inevitably, we appreciate here too, don't eat some of it today and stash the rest of it away for tomorrow because, you know, having seen that the manna isn't falling on the Sabbath, maybe you're going to start getting nervous that it won't be falling the following day either. No. You're to eat everything that you have left over on the Sabbath because, verse 26, six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath. In it, there shall be none. And here's, regrettably, the next failing. There are two failings after the manna comes. In verse 27, and it came to pass on the seventh day, that there went out some of the people together, and they found none. And God said unto Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions, my teachings? See that God has given you the Sabbath. Therefore he gives you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide you every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So. We read in verse 30, the people ceased from work, or they rested, on the seventh day. So, when we consider this initial introduction to the manna, again, we can't help but sense the tension here. The manna is coming in response to the people murmuring murmuring against Moses and Aaron, in effect, essentially, murmuring against God. And after they get it, they're still not satisfied. There are these two distinct failings where they mess up, both with respect to keeping the manna over from one day to the next in opposition to what Moses had instructed, and again in their going out to gather the manna on the Sabbath in opposition to the second instruction on this subject, which again was being violated. So a rather sorry state of affairs, we must admit. We're going to have to consider what the underlying psychology is of this failure to obey God's instructions with respect to manna, because I suspect that understanding those failings teaches us an important lesson that we need to integrate with respect to ourselves. But again, more on that later. For now, we bear in mind there are these two distinct failings that are manifest when the manna starts happening. And finally, by way of summation, in verse 31, and the house of Israel called the name thereof manna. Well, we already saw, they asked it as a question or stated it as a declaration. Either what is it or it is manna, provisions, a gift. This becomes the proper noun. It is manna. And it was like coriander seed in shape white in color, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And in verse 35, 
And the children of Israel did eat the manna 40 years until they came to a land inhabited. They did eat the manna until they came to the borders of the land of Canaan. I can't help but note here, at least parenthetically, that this is, of course, the first place in the Bible that we are told of what, of course, we know very well in retrospect, that instead of going straight into the land of Israel, the nation would indeed remain in the wilderness 40 years, which of course is implicitly another reference to their having messed up. Because after all, it was due to the sin of the spies that the entry into the land of Israel did not happen immediately, but only the following generation. First place where that sin too is at least implied is here in the story of the manna. But, of course, in context, it's simply telling us that they ate the manna for 40 years. The manna kept on coming. Does that mean that they became happy with it? Sad to say, evidently not. Uh, in a, in a rough, uh, time? Uh, okay. Uh, I didn't understand what you said about uh, the thing about uh, being at the border and, and the other people you mentioned or something. The things or something. Again, that they remain in the wilderness for 40 years yeah. is something that we only learn, of course, in detail in Numbers chapter 13 as a result of the sin of the spies. At this and point, it is a tantalizing indication that there are problems ahead. But of course, with respect to the manna, we have enough problems right now. As we'll see, let's continue with Numbers chapter 11, because there's a lot of scenery that I'd like to share with you first, okay? Okay. Okay. So, in Numbers chapter 11, we read of yet another story of the manna, it's significant to note that while in Exodus chapter 16, despite the murmurings, despite the whining of the children of Israel, God gives them nothing but all the patience and all the gifts. In Numbers chapter 11, and a mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting or craved the craving, and the children of Israel also wept on their part and said, Would that we were given flesh to eat, again asking for meat. We remember the fish which we were wont to eat in Egypt for naught, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. And of course, inevitably, one can't help but wonder for naught, they were getting that for free. The Egyptians weren't even giving them straw for free to make the bricks. They were giving them food for free. But this manna comes with, to use the expression, strings attached. There are extra responsibilities that go with it. And maybe that's what they wish to be free of. More on that still later. But again, we consider just how complex their relationship with this manna is. That is, after talking about all the food they're dreaming about from when they were in Egypt, in verse 6, but now our soul is dried away, there is nothing at all. We have not saved this manna to look to. Now, the Torah interjects here, as it were, just what the manna was, in case we might have forgotten. Now, the manna was like coriander seed, again in shape, and the appearance thereof as the appearance of the bellium or crystal pearl. And the people went about, that is, they just had to go out and gather it and ground it in mills or beat it in mortars and seeped it in pots and made cakes of it. They could do whatever they wanted with this manna. And the taste of it was as the taste of a cake baked with oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. A brief interjection I feel compelled to share with you. And that is that 
you may note that what we just read in this verse, in chapter 11, verse 9 in Numbers, and when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, seems to be in contradiction with what we saw in Exodus chapter 16, verse 14, and when the layer of dew was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness was a fine scale-like, or grain-like, flaky thing. The manna was under the dew. So in Exodus, the manna is under the dew. In Numbers, the dew is under the manna. Which is it? Is it a contradiction? So I'm just calling our attention to it because, of course, we don't regard it as a contradiction. In our tradition, the answer is they're both true. The dew fell first, the manna fell on top of the dew, and then another dew fall came, covering over the manna. So the manna was gift wrapped, both beneath it and above it, a layer of dew protecting it. And that is one of the reasons, personally, my favorite reason for the custom that we Jews have to cover the chalot, the loaves of bread, at the Sabbath and festival meals, and there are always two loaves, as a remembrance of the blessing of the manna that on the eve of the Sabbath, and presumably also on the eve of the holy days, fell in double portion. So as a remembrance of that, we used two loaves on the Sabbath and on the festivals in the special meals that we have. And we cover the loaves with a cover, the chala cover, just like the manna. There's a tablecloth beneath it, and there's a chala cover above it. As a remembrance of those two layers of dew that gift wrapped the manna. Okay, I just figured I would mention that as a parenthetical aside. But getting back to what was taking place in Numbers chapter 11, because this is anything but a pleasant story, remember, they're complaining. The man has all these special qualities, and all they're saying is, we remember all the food that we got for free in Egypt. And at this point, as we read in the following verses, Moses himself is so exasperated, he's ready to resign. Verse 10, and Moses heard the people weeping, family by family, every man at the door of his tent. And the anger of God was kindled greatly, and Moses was displeased. And Moses said unto God, Wherefore has, have you dealt ill with your servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in your sight, that you lay the burden of all this people upon me? Have I conceived all this people? Have I borne them or begotten them? that you say to me, carry them in your bosom, as a nursing father carries a suckling child unto the land which you did swear to their fathers? When shall I have meat, flesh, to give unto all this people? For they trouble me with their weeping, saying, give us flesh, give us meat, that we may eat. I am not able to bear all this people myself alone, because it is too heavy for me. And if you deal thus with me, kill me, I pray you. I can't take it anymore. If I have found favor in your sight, and let me not look upon my wretchedness. So certainly, Moses regards this continual complaining, murmuring with respect to the manna as something that's bringing him to the brink of being broken. And furthermore, we can't help but note that this time, as opposed to what we read in Exodus chapter 16, there is punishment. In the continuation of the chapter, in verse 31, and there went forth a wind from the sea and brought across quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp, about a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp, and about two cubits above the face of the earth. And the people rose up all the day and all the night and all the next day and gathered the quails. He that gathered least gathered ten heaps. And they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. And 
verse 33. While the flesh, the meat, was yet between their teeth, ere it was finished, the anger of God was kindled against the people, and God smote the people with a very great plague. And the name of that place was called Kivrot HaTa'ava, which literally means graves of the lost or graves of the craving, because there they buried the people that lost it, that craved. A rather sorrowful conclusion to the story. Again, they're complaining. They don't like the man. And that's not it. Ten chapters later, in Numbers chapter 21, verse 4, and they journeyed from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to encompass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became impatient because of the way. Verse 5, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. And what are they, are they complaining about here again? Wherefore have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, there is no water, and... Our soul loathes this bread. In the Hebrew, it's lechem haklokel. Again, an ambiguous, vague haptax. Either this light bread or this insubstantial bread or this rotten bread, but we don't want it anymore. And again, as we saw in Numbers chapter 11, this time, as opposed to in Exodus chapter 16, there is punishment. And God sent fiery or venomous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. So you get some kind of a sense here of a very unpleasant, unhealthy, even deadly dynamism. They're getting this miracle, bread from heaven every day, and they don't like it. They don't want it. They're complaining relentlessly. They complained that they didn't have any bread, and when God sends them this bread, they don't stop complaining. And it's significant to note that we find this theme of ingratitude, of getting the gifts and still complaining bitterly in what amounts to retrospective indictments of the behavior of the children of Israel in the wilderness in much later sources, both in Psalms and in the words of rebuke in the beginning of the Second Temple period that we read in Nehemiah. First, to consider Psalm 78, the psalm recounts the great miracles that God did to Israel. It's for brevity, we're starting with verse 14. The previous verse speaks of the splitting of the sea, which we read just shortly before Exodus chapter 16, the splitting of the sea is in Exodus chapter 14, the song over the splitting in Exodus chapter 15. And then in verse 14 here, reflecting what we read in Exodus chapter 13, and again in Exodus chapter 14 as well, by day also he led them with a cloud, and all the night with a light of fire. He cleaved rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as out of the great deep. Well, that we read in Exodus chapter 17. He brought streams of flowing water also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. Yet, went they on still to Sildon against him to rebel against the Most High in the desert. How? This is going to sound awfully familiar. And they tested God in their heart by asking food for their craving. Yea, they spoke against God. They said, Can God bear a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that waters dust flowed out and streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Or will he provide flesh for his people? We're not sure. We're challenging God. Verse 15. 
Verse 21, therefore, God heard and was wroth. And the fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also went up against Israel. Because they believed not in God, and trusted not in his salvation. Can you imagine? They didn't believe in God after everything they'd seen. They saw a sea split. They saw waters coming forth from a rock. All the miracles of the Exodus, all the plagues of Egypt. We're not sure yet. We don't know if we believe in God or not. Sounds absurd. What exactly is this deficiency of belief? And of course, it's significant to note that still and all, the emphasis as presented in Psalm 78 is, despite what they're doing, consider where God is getting them. And he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. And verse 24, we read explicitly. And he caused manna to rain upon them for food and gave them of the corn of heaven. Man did eat the bread of the mighty. He sent them provisions to the full. Referring to this extraordinary gift of bread from heaven. But they're not happy. They still complain. And similarly, in Nehemiah chapter 9, then the Levites, Yeshua and Kadmiel, Bani, Hashab, Nea, Sherebia, Hodia, Shebania, and Ptahia said, Stand up and bless God your Lord from everlasting to everlasting, and let them say, Blessed be your glorious name that is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are God, even you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, and the earth, and all the things that are thereon, the seas, and all that is in them, and you preserve them all, the hosts of heaven prostrate themselves before you, and then the focus, once again, on the wonders of the Exodus. Skipping to verse 9, and you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt, and you heard their cry by the Red Sea, and did show signs and wonders upon Pharaoh and on all his servants and on all the people of his land. For you knew that they dealt proudly against them, and you did get yourself a name as it is this day. And you divided the sea before them. So they went through the midst of the sea on the dry land. And their pursuers you cast into the depths as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, in a pillar of cloud you led them by day, and a pillar of fire by night, to give them light in the way wherein they should go. Again, recounting the miracles that we just saw. Right before Exodus chapter 16, the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire in Exodus chapter 13, and again repeated in Exodus chapter 14, the splitting of the sea in Exodus chapter 14, and the singing of the song over it the following chapter, all that as a prelude. Now, skipping forward, you came down also upon Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them upright ordinances and laws instructions, teachings of truth, good statutes and commandments. You gave them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandments and statutes and, again, law, Torah, teaching by the hand of Moses, your servant. And what else did you do? Here it is again. And gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst. To what end? and did command them that they should come in to possess the land that you had lifted up your hand to give them. Tantalizing, isn't it? We're going to see this expressed in Deuteronomy as well. Some kind of connection between integrating the appropriate message of the manna and coming into the land of Israel. But what happened? What happened was they keep on making problems. Verse 16 but they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their neck and hearkened not to your commandments and refused to hearken, neither were mindful of your wonders that you did among them, but hardened their neck and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. And still and all, God's forbearance, but you are a God ready to pardon, gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy, and forsook them not. And they kept on going. When they 
had made them a molten calf and said, this is your God who brought you out of Egypt and had wrought great provocations. When you consider everything they did, still and all, yet you, in your manifold mercies, forsook them not in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud departed not from over them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way wherein they should go. You still gave them these gifts. You gave also your good spirit to instruct them, teachings. And moreover, this of course is critical to our discussion, you withheld not your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Yea, 40 years, you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Their clothes waxed not old and their feet swelled not. You're giving them these gifts. And again, you give them these gifts because of the murmurings and the complaints that they thrust at you beforehand. And after you give the gifts, they keep on complaining and keep on making problems after. And again, this is history. It's a history that we read with bowed heads and with shame. But it's not here only to teach us history. Inevitably, it's here to teach us what we need to do right, even if they were doing it wrong. So inevitably, our challenge is to understand what their problem was and what was the test to which God had made reference. Remember, at the very beginning, that God said in Exodus chapter 16, verse 4, I will cause to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people will go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may prove them, test them, test them whether they will walk in my Torah, my instruction, my teaching, or not. What's the test about? And of course, inevitably, how do we understand in that context their failings? Their failings in Exodus chapter 16, to review, in stashing the manna overnight, against the explicit instruction of Moses to not keep any of it overnight. And they're going out to look for the manna on the Sabbath against the explicit instruction of Moses that there won't be any manna on the Sabbath. What's going on? Maybe the first key to emphasize here is to return to an issue that we already noted. And that is the first place, maybe, that the word manna, man, appears. Just it's not even clear that that's what appears, but maybe it is. Again, Exodus chapter 16, verse 15, that when the children of Israel saw it, either they asked one another, what is it? Or they said to one another, it is man, which we can render as manna by transliteration, or render as provisions, a gift, as a translation. Now, what do I mean by translation here? What is the root? We've discussed roots on many occasions in the past, and I think this is a particularly instructive opportunity to do so. What is the root of man? Or again, Hebrew, man. Which leads to a tantalizing proposal, and that is a word that certainly appears to be a cognate of the man, again, the original Hebrew, they weren't talking English. They weren't saying manna. Man. 
the cognate word is one that we encounter on exactly five occasions in the Bible, four of which, interestingly enough, are in the book of Jonah. The word in the Hebrew is Vayiman. What does Vayiman mean? We could render it as prepared, but probably more rigorously as appointed. So in Jonah chapter 2, verse 1, Vayiman Hashem, God prepared or appointed a great fish to swallow up Yana, and Yana was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And then in, in chapter 4, when he is sitting outside of town, outside of Nineveh, to see what will happen there, Vayiman Hashem Elkin, the Lord God, again, prepared or pointed a gourd and made it come up over Yonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his distress. And in the very next verse, again, Vayiman, Vayiman Elohim, God prepared, anoint, appointed a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smelled the gourd that it withered. And the very next verse, again, and it came to pass when the sun arose that God prepared or appointed a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Yana that he fainted. Lest we think that Vayiman is for some reason a verb that can only be applied to God, the fifth instance in which we encounter the word is at the beginning of the book of Daniel specifically chapter 1, verse 5, we read at the beginning of the book, beginning from verse 3, the king, referring to Nebuchadnezzar, spoke to Ashpenaz, his chief officer, that he should bring in certain of the children of Israel, of the seed royal and of the nobles, youths in whom was no blemish, but fair to look on, and skillful in all wisdom, and skillful in knowledge, and discerning in thought, and such had ability to stand in the king's palace, and that he should teach them the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans and the king, Vayiman, appointed for them a daily portion of the king's food and of the wine which he drank, and that they should be nourished for years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Why is this so important? Vayiman, appointed. Well, while the last example refers to an appointment by a human being, King Nebuchadnezzar, let's consider what the significant theme of Vayiman is with respect to the individuals who are the object of this appointment, or these appointments that are bestowed upon them. In the four instances in which Vayiman appears in the book of Yonah, the appointments refer respectively to the big fish, to the gourd, to the worm, and to the wind, all of which are specifically appointed by God with respect to Yonah. And of course, what is most significant, most critical, is in each instance, Yonah has nothing to do with it. He's the object, all right. These appointments are bestowed upon him, but he's not in control at all. The appointment is coming directly, exclusively, from God, not through any agency of his own. Likewise, in the fifth example, in the book of Daniel, obviously Daniel and his companions 
have nothing to do with this appointment of the daily portion of the king's food. Indeed, as we read in the continuation of the chapter, they have a problem with it. But they're not in control. They're the objects, the recipients, not the ones who are controlling anything. And maybe this is really the crux of the issue, the problem. The problem is all about control. Who's in charge? That is, at the outset, in Exodus chapter 16, the children of Israel are complaining. They're complaining because they don't have food. And God's response is, they don't have food, I'll give them food. They'll have everything they need, but they need to learn to relinquish one thing. And that one thing they need to relinquish is absolutely critical for their spiritual education. They need to relinquish control. They need to recognize they're not the ones who are in charge. God is. And I think it's significant for us in this vein to consider in particular those two failings and what they signify respectively. The first failing was hoarding the manna overnight against the instruction of Moses, whereupon it becomes putrid and rots. The second, going out to look for manna on the Sabbath, likewise against the explicit instruction of Moses. Well, if you want to feel that you are in control of how much property you have, there are inevitably precisely two things you can do. Either you control your expenses or you control your income. That is, if you want to increase your property, you control, you limit your expenses, or you control, you increase your income. The first feeling pertained to the first of these problems. That is, if they gathered precisely enough for each member of the household for one day, then obviously, if they had anything left over to try to hoard overnight, it was by limiting expenses. They, or other members of their household, were not satisfied because they didn't eat their full. They deprived themselves. They went hungry in order to be able to stash away the manna for the next day. And what did they accomplish? Of course, they accomplished absolutely nothing. Because by the next day, the manna was putrid, inedible, worthless. They had to look for fresh manna every day. That was a failing that was a result of trying to control what their expenses would be. And what was the second failing? The second failing was going out to look for manna on the Sabbath. In other words, wanting to control income. I should be able to get more if I work harder. They already saw that they were totally incapable of increasing their income by gathering more manna. Because remember, no matter how much you gathered, when you brought it back and you actually measured how much was there, whether you gathered a lot or you gathered a little, you had exactly what you needed for all the members of the household. So you couldn't increase your income on a daily basis. Maybe if I look for the manna on the Sabbath, when it's out of bounds, so to speak, so maybe the rules won't apply and I'll be able to get some extra manna in there and I'll be able to do some hoarding. And maybe this manna will be all the better because after all, this manna didn't putrefy overnight, so I'll be able to stock up on it. 
and it accomplishes nothing. Because there's no manna at all to be found on the Sabbath. And much to the chagrin of the hoarders and the seekers, the ones who were doing their utmost to limit their expenses, and the ones who were doing their utmost to augment their income. They weren't in control. They couldn't control anything. Consider, in particular, in this vein, the way God describes the failing that when they go out to gather the manna on the seventh day, God says, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? On the most specific plane, the problem is they're not listening to what God commands. But then there's the additional dimension, the way it is expressed in Psalm 78, the real underlying problem was they didn't believe in God. They didn't trust in his salvation. Now, again, as we noted, when we considered these verses, specifically this verse, Psalm 78, verse 22, a few moments ago, we noted the veritable absurdity. How could they not believe in God? All the plagues of Egypt, all the miracles of the Exodus, they just saw the sea split. The bread is raining down from heaven. They don't believe in God. But in this sense, they weren't prepared to believe. They weren't prepared to relinquish control. We have an ancient saying in our tradition that if someone has bread in his basket and says, what am I going to eat tomorrow? He is small in faith. He doesn't really believe. Now, mind you, does that mean that you're supposed to be completely oblivious of planning for the next day? No, but if you think that you're the one who's in control, if you're worried because you think you have to take care of everything because you're the one who's in charge, if altogether you think you're the one who's in charge, you really don't believe in God. This isn't just a problem for them. This is a problem for us. That's why we're not learning history here. We're learning how to live right now, right here, all the time. And this, of course, again, for the nation of Israel, newly freed from slavery, was an ongoing challenge. They didn't like the manna. They kept on complaining about the manna. Numbers chapter 11, Numbers chapter 21, because what the manna is demanding of them is precisely what they are striving to hold on to at all costs, to feel that as opposed to the slave who doesn't control anything, that they're in control. And the manna is forcing them to admit they're not in control. God's in control. They don't take nicely to that at all. And when we consider that as the essential issue, that what the man is, as expressed again in that conjugation that we saw in Jonah and in Daniel, something appointed, something that comes from God, something that is emblematic of God's control and not our own, then we can appreciate what is the final source that I'd like us to consider, and that is the message in Deuteronomy chapter 8. 
all the commandments that I command you this day you shall observe to do, that you may live and multiply and come in and possess the land that God swore unto your fathers. We already noted the connection here. The connection that pertains to being able to merit entry into the promised land. Let's see how that merit plays out in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And you shall remember all the way that God your Lord led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might afflict you to prove or test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. To know, we should stress, obviously does not mean here that God needs to know what is in our hearts, because God knows what's in our hearts. More to make known, to make it clear, to make it obvious to external observers, maybe more importantly, to make it obvious to ourselves what's really going on inside. And he afflicted you and suffered you to hunger and fed you with manna that you knew not, neither did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread only, but by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God does man live. How is that lesson going to be learned to you? Of course, on the one hand, because if not for God, you'll have anything to eat. So that, of course, we readily appreciate. But that message is, I suspect, only part of the subject. That is, the beginning of verse 3, on the face of it, it seems awfully strange. You're sleeping and suffering from hunger, but you aren't hungry. You have the manna. Once he fed you with manna, you weren't hungry. Yeah, but... You felt the hunger of not being in control. You were hungry for having a big bank account of manna that will tide you over for a rainy day. You know, when you lose your job, when you don't have a source of income, and you need to be in charge. But you don't need to be in charge. And even when you expend the effort, it's important for us to know, We're not in charge. And the ongoing miracles, your raiment waxed not old upon you, neither did your foot swell these 40 years. And you shall consider in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so God your Lord chastens you, because he's teaching you. And you shall keep the commandments of God your Lord to walk in his ways and to fear him. And that, in the verses that that follow, becomes the basis of the entry into the promised land. How so? Continuation of Deuteronomy chapter 8. Beware, lest you forget God your Lord in not keeping his commandments, his ordinances, and his statutes that I command you this day. Lest when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when your herds and flocks multiply, and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, Then your heart be lifted up, and you forget God your Lord, who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, who led you through the great and dreadful wilderness, wherein were serpents, fiery or venomous serpents, and scorpions, and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you forth water out of a rock of flint, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers knew not that he might afflict you, and he might prove you, test you, to do you good in your latter end. What good does it do you? Very simple. The good of teaching you how properly to look at life, to recognize that God is in control because there's a danger that when you forget God you may say in your heart my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth in other words the illusion that I am in control the reason that the manna is stated in the previous verse as 
the basis of God proving you, testing you, to do you good in your latter end. Is because that's what will enable you to realize, verse 18, you shall remember God your Lord, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. That he may establish his covenant, which he swore unto your fathers, as it is this day. No, no. The antidote to saying, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth, is not to say, ironically enough, that my power and the might of my hand did not get me this wealth. No. Your power and the might of your hand has gotten you this wealth. Just remember where the power comes from. Verse 18 doesn't tell you to say that my power and the might of my hand had nothing to do with this wealth. It just tells you that you need to remember God, your Lord, gave you the power to get the wealth. In other words, of course, you need to do what you need to do. But you need to know that everything that you're doing is, in effect, as God's proxy, as God's messenger. You used your power, but God gave you the power. That's what believing in God is about. Not sitting back passively, because, you know, with the manna as well, they didn't sit back passively. They didn't just open up their mouths and say, okay, God, fill it. That's not the way it worked. You had to go out and gather it. Just you knew that the reason that you were able to gather it was because God was giving it to you. And indeed, in much the same vein, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10, the message, whatsoever your hand tends to do by your power, same word, power, in the Hebrew, as the koach, the power that indeed gets you the wealth, but that comes from God. Whatsoever your hand attains to do, by your power that do. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where you're going. Now, of course, if we were talking about applying ourselves physically for mere material benefit, obviously in the grave, none of that material benefit will avail us in any way. We read, of course, in Psalm 48, that when, Psalm 49, when God gives us all of that wealth, it doesn't follow us into the grave. So the emphasis can never be on merely materially amassing wealth through our power. No. Rather, it's about recognizing that we are summoned in our lives in this world to do everything in our capacity, to use all the power that we've got, because all the power that we've got, we've got because God gave it to us in order to accomplish what is truly our mission in the world. We have work to do. And to the extent that we have that work to do, it's imperative for us to recognize we have power. But equally important, maybe more important, for us to recognize that the power comes from God. That God remains the one who's in control. The manna is there to teach us that lesson. Now mind you, the manna was just a very brief blip in history, 40 years. Those 40 years of manna, again, are intended, as expressed in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, to remember God your Lord, that he may establish his covenant that he swore unto your fathers as it is this day. Which covenant? The promise of the promised land. 
Because the promise to the promised land is, after all, a promise. To come into a land where you're not going to be getting bread that comes down from heaven. Where you'll get bread by the sweat of your brow. You'll get bread because you made it grow from below. And that danger is lurking all the more that you might think, I'm in charge. I did it myself. If you learn the message of manna, you will have inoculated yourself against that danger. You'll know that you have power, that the power comes from God. You'll know that you are charged to work, that he is the one who is in charge. You'll know that you have a job to do, and he, by his good grace, has, has made you into his junior partner. And by doing so, that you earn God's blessings. That's the message and the blessing of the manna.